from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. I'm Ann McLean from the Library's Music Division, and with me are Annette Reisinger and Matthias Diener from the terrific Mingat Quartet. We're really pleased to welcome them for their first appearance at the Library of Congress. Thank you. Thank you. And as you'll find out tonight, in just a moment, the Mingat is admired for beautifully intimate, expressive playing, and also an adventurous pursuit of a huge range of repertoire that takes in unknown masters from the past and masters from today. Um, and we'll be talking a little bit about some of those composers that you're performing and recording. Some that I didn't know, Heinrich Herzogenberg is one, um, unusual. Glenn Gould, they recorded a work by Glenn Gould, the pianist, last year. They worked with Wolf came Rehm over a decade to record the complete quartets and also recorded his fascinating piece at Lux with the excellent Welgas Ensemble. It's an incredible piece. And in January, they'll be performing Hinostera Quartets at the Elbe Philharmonie. So that gives you just a little bit of a picture. Tonight, we look forward to your beautiful and interesting program highlighting the wonderful Czech repertoire with works by Ms. Levicek, whom I did not know, Suk, Janacek, and Dvorak, plus a Mahler arrangement by you. So that's a whole subject in itself, the many threads that connect great Czech composers and great quartets. So first, I wanted to ask you about the name of your group, the Minguet. I know something about this, and I'm fascinated by the man for whom you're named. Tell us about him. Yeah, actually, he was a Spanish uh, philosopher so in the uh, 18th century, and he was one of the last general scientists. You know, he, uh, it was not only about science and, you know, real science and humanity, but it was still the idea of putting everything together. So he... He wrote uh, texts, books about optics, uh, about uh, insects, um, but also, of course, about fine arts. And his major quote and his major idea was that uh, music or fine art in general shouldn't be only for the um, upper 10,000, what he said, but should be able uh, to enjoy for everybody, so kind of the the opposite of what La Polar would stand for later. You know the the the, the flow of La Polar, which means art is really like in a in an own tower. Uh, how we, in German we say Elfenbeinturm, you know. And it's, um, but um, <clears throat> so he he decided and he said it should be uh, available for everybody. And um, as quartet is a very pure. Um, art. I mean, I always say it's not like opera, it's more like poetry. I mean, four people talking to each other without any uh, substitute, like n not 40 camels on the stage or something, you know, like in operas. It's just boring four peoples, but they are playing the most beautiful music and the most exciting music. And um, as it was always like for saloons or for every, uh, for very uh, educated people, this kind of music, uh, we decided it should be, like Minget said, it should be available for everybody. And th this idea is always more and more important. Um, this year we had already the chance to play, for example, in South Korea. Mm -hmm. Now we are here, we were in Mongolia, we were in Hong Kong. It's not only to go there and there and there, but also to bring the people a little bit together. And um, for us it's really great to be here today and also to bring this idea here for And you also play in hospitals and prisons, right? S sometimes, if, if there are some projects, yes, if, if we have a chance, we will like Charity, Charity concerts, yeah, of course. If, uh, and for kids in schools as well, we have an education program running in Germany, actually founded by a p uh, famous pianist colleague, Lars Vogt, who's probably well known here mm -hmm. as well. He, uh, he invented a program called Rhapsody in School, Funnily enough, and um, so we are part of this project as well. So when we come into a city and we have enough time, then in the morning we go to uh, schools and play for children or students mm -hmm. and hope that they come in the evening as well. <laughs> and sometimes they does. <laughs> and sometimes we have also the chance to do this in uh, foreign countries. For example, we did it for 500 children in India or something. Yeah, <laughs> you toured in India then as well. Yes. yes. 
Mm. My goodness. And so in your spare time, I think you also have a festival, right? Is it it's you who has the festival? Yeah, I just invented recently. It's uh, in, uh, in, yeah, near, near where we live in Cologne. We are, the quartet is based in Cologne, and we are actually, uh, over the years, not really living in Cologne anymore. So we are a little bit spread, and I live outside Cologne in the countryside. It's a very beautiful uh, area between Germany and Belgium, kind of on the mm. border. And there are very old houses from 1600, re right. really European old. Mm -hmm. And um, so, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, as even old for us. So, uh, uh, so I just started a little, a little festival, yeah, to yeah, give right. something back because okay. I, I love to live, live there, and I try to give something back to the village people. There. So, yeah. Well, obviously, you're very busy uh, all over the world, and uh, the, the repertoire particularly interests me, the, the fact that you've made time to really study and pursue a lot of these people that we don't know. And in, I wanted to start with Miss Levichek, am I saying this correctly? We have actually on display tonight in our glass case a copious manuscript of mm -hmm. the piece you are performing tonight. No, really? We, yes, we found, my colleagues wow. found it in uh, our collections, yeah. and it's fancy, it probably came from an aristocratic household where they had regular music evenings, you know. Um, and we also have a whole Czech display, uh, Krenik, Husa, and so on, including the uh, autograph of the Mahler song that you transcribed. Wow. So we'll get to that in a moment. But I wanted to, Ms. Levichek is a name that is so new to us. And how long have you been playing his work? Uh, it's also uh, new for us. But uh, <laughs> we, um, <laughs> um, he was a um, composer of the Mannheimer Schule. It's a Mannheim school. And um, he was a colleague or, or friend of Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. Um, and I discussed with an organizer of concerts from Dresden some years ago, and he, which is very close to the franchise of the Czech Republic. And he brought me to this composer and to this name, and it's a good alternative to Mozart or Haydn um, to, sh to show really the music of the time, not the upper class, but the music of the, the people. So I think it's very interesting. And for me, um, when, um, if I can come to the whole program a little bit, um, it's a bohemian program, but all the composers are international people in their time. Mm -hmm. So this Miss Livicek, he was born in Prague, but he, he died in Rome, and he had a, a very colored <laughs> life, and it, it was very hard to, to travel in this time, to, for example, from Prague to Italy, and he was on other places too. And um, Josef Suk, naturally, as a son-in-law uh, of Dvorak, he was also very international. Dvorak, mm -hmm. it's well known. Um, uh, Janacek, uh, who, um, who, who worked with so many um, international things, like the Kreuzer Sonate of Tolstoy, which is Russian, um, and Mahler, the story is also well known. And he was born in the Czech Republic, Mahler. Yeah, yeah, so it's really a complete bohemian program. Yeah, <laughs> in a so way. As soon as I saw the Mahler song on there, I said, this is exciting. I've, we've got to choose this program. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about how you decided to do you transcribe a lot of things. We'll talk about that. Uh, if that's, for fun. Uh, that's my opus one. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> and I did it only. I, I I had always the dream to do this um, because um, we don't have repertoire for, of Mahler, and it's one of my yeah. famous, uh, my most um, uh, the composers what I li like uh, very very much and I'm my hometown is where where I was born he's it's in the near of all this it's Passau in Bavaria so it's all in front of the Danube um, mm -hmm. and near the Attersee where Mahler composed the second and third symphony and um, in 2011 when uh, there was the Mahler year of death 100 years of death I thought it would be very nice um, to bring something to the people, especially in the smaller cities where they cannot hear a symphony of Mahler because it's too expensive for them. Um, and I, I thought perhaps a little chance to, um, to bring the great harmonic in this small piece. And it's very good to combine it also with the um, second Vienna school, with Webern, and it's always the bridge from 
Brahms from Beethoven to Schönberg, Webern, etc. So it's a, only a small mosaic stone. <laughs> Um, you know, I want to go back to Ms. Levishak for just a moment, too, but before we, we let's go back uh, and forth a moment. So with the Mahler, I was thinking when I heard this, this uh, the Souk piece, the ballada, that it had reminded me a little bit of some of the Mahler harmonies and ideas in his piano quartet, which was also a teenage piece. You know, this, this Souk piece you said was 16, he was 16 or so when he wrote the piece. But, um, and my colleague hears the early Wagner harmonies of Lohengrin yeah. in the ballada too. So it, it's a very interesting piece and he's somebody that we don't know enough about. And as you say, he's a figure that his history is woven through uh, the whole history, his family history of, the, of Czech quartets. And um, was he was with the Czech quartet itself, right? The, yeah, the famous quartet. Um, and I think premiered some of these works. Um, it's a dynasty of violinists. He, he, this Joseph Suk, there are more, uh, some uh, different Joseph Suks. Yeah. B because it, this, <laughs> this exactly. Joseph Suk, he was a, a son-in-law of Dvorak. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I think when I hear the music, he would like to be the son-in-law uh, son of Dvorak, so he composed oh. this direction <laughs> a little bit. So, because later he composed in, in direction, already in the direction of Second Vienna School. There are, we recorded all mm -hmm. his works for String Quartet and it's really far away from these sounds of, of Bohemian sounds. Yes, very yeah. modernist. And there is another, Josef Suk, he was the son or yeah. son, yeah. The interesting thing is that at this time, um, we are talking now, we are thinking borders, right? Czech. Austria and Germany. We have to think in this time, this was kind of one culture, or it was really mixed when you think Franz Kafka was writing in German, living in Prague, writing in German. Um, uh, Mahler, which is, we, we think of, of course, an Austrian composer, but born in, in Czech. And uh, so this is um, very important to know that this was kind of a combination and uh, of several cultures and influenced. It's, it's not about nationalism at all. So this is very important. And like you said, with the, and Wagner, of course, as well, coming into it. And um, I think the time was ready for, to improve the harmonic into a chromatic harmonic uh, till uh, Schoenberg, which said, okay, there is nothing, there is no I can't go on, I can't go any further. That's, you know, after Mahler, what, what shall we do? It's so tensed already, it's so chromatic, uh, the harmony, so uh, I have to do something new to, to be still expressive. But at this time, like Suk, Mahler, uh, Dvorak, that they started to explore, I mean, even earlier, Schumann, but there with Schumann, we are more in the Rhine area, so this is more up, up. Uh, more, uh, more north, northern, but uh, in Czech they, they started really to experience how far can they go to expand um, the harmonic, the uh, major and minor harmonic with a lot of chromatic, mm -hmm. like Mahler did. Yeah. You know, this um, in terms of the, the quartet tradition, um, each of these works that you're playing tonight takes it in, in a further step. Like with Ms. Levicek, he was a classicist, but he was um, a model, perhaps, for Mozart and so on. But he also was doing symphonies and opera seria and, yeah. you know, wind quintets. But he, they say he's someone who helped develop the roots for this, this early quartet form. And I believe I understand that he, his works were known as divertimenti, as Haydn's early ones were also divertimenti. So you have him, and then, as you say, you have Suk, uh, such an interesting figure. And yeah. this... Uh, too, uh, and going on to Jana Czech, I'm so interested in hearing your thoughts about this piece. You could talk about it so much oh, from yeah. both the pragmatic, programmatic point of view yeah. exhaustively, <laughs> and you can also talk about it from the structural point of view, which you must know so intimately. So I, I want to talk of, about that too. Of course. I think it's a very interesting program because, or I, well, yeah, let's start from another point of view. We are always, we have the tendency in a lot of programs, our times when we play music from the past, that we just concentrate on absolutely highlights. And then we think the whole time is like that, but it's not. And we have to honor and uh, appreciate all the kind of ground workers. I mean, Mozart, outstanding, Beethoven, outstanding, Schumann, outstanding. 
but there have been loads of other composers which were very important for the time and very important for the for these highlights composers as well i mean we all know the the the, the drama story about salieri and mozart for example we, so and but this is very very important and i think it's also important to play the music to really understand why is mozart a genius and Salieri is absolutely great, but maybe not a genius, you know. So, and that might be the same with Mislivicek. So he's he's he was very very important in the time, and it's not fair to uh, to not play him anymore. Mm -hmm. And he's really really wonderful. He's maybe not Beethoven or not Haydn genius, but he's very very good, and it's uh, worth absolutely worth playing it. What I heard you rehearsing was very interesting yeah. to me, and you, you know, I, I wouldn't have known which composer it was really, but it was so graceful, um, elegant writing, and so Absolutely. on. So we're looking forward. It's fun through you. We are discovering something we didn't have the chance to before. Um, and before leaving him, I was going to just say that um, people talk about him as somebody that Mozart was very connected to, and they had all these references in the correspondence to him. Yeah. You might look about, I think there's some references in our program, um, but there are more than 40 comments about him in the yeah. family correspondence. So he was really an, an intimate for a period of time, a major figure in opera, and um, they, the, the writers who write about these, of course, kinds of things and comment on the letters, say that the letter about him, when but Mozart visited him in the hospital, I believe, or after he'd had yeah. some very serious treatments for what was most likely syphilis. But the letter is very, very personal and affecting, um, more so than much of the correspondence that you read from, from Mozart, and very empathetic with the man's situation. And he said, I could, how could I leave my friend, my dear friend? And Miss Lebechak. So, um, anyway, as you say, a model and a friend. Um, I want to to talk with you too a little bit about the the Czech quartet sound and that Central European sound. This is a bit of a segue, uh, non segue, but non sequitur. But you know, you hear these great, great Czech quartets, uh, just like German quartets, which have that deep, rich sound. And, and they have a certain kind of a, a feel about the timbre and so on. We've had so many through here at, at the library, you know, the Skampa, Vihan, Prajak, and so on. So do you think that this is something, from your study, is this something one learns about as a style? Um, yes, it is, and I think there is a still a big difference between the Czech quartets and the German quartets, or the Austrian quartets. Um, it's very funny because when I was a child, I had the chance to go to concerts very early with my parents. And because I'm coming from the French, uh, fr yeah, to, from the French to, to the Czech Republic, only 20 minutes by car, they came um, uh, also before the wall was was uh, gone, they came to our city for concerts, and it was for me. It, I I had not uh, the the few in the future that I will play quartet later. So <laughs> I started still with my violin, <laughs> but um, I remember very good that um, the people were very very close together, and in in very old coat uh, dress. <laughs> so it was very very impressive to see them. Um, it was an, uh, not a highlight, but to be together and uh, teamwork, a really uh, deep teamwork, I remember. V very good to these uh, concerts. Yeah, I think they, I am a strong believer. Um, well, nowadays, you know, we, we, we have teachers uh, from all over the world and it's mixed more and more. And so why? Is a German quartet sounding different from a French quartet and an English quartet and a Russian quartet? Still, we still might have the same uh, teacher. For example, I had the same teacher like our colleagues uh, playing in other quartets. So why is why are they sounding different? I'm a strong believer that's because of the language. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so it's the same. You know, why is a Russian composer writing different uh, in terms of sounds for songs, for example? Um, than a German composer, or why is an Italian opera Puccini sounding so different from Mozart or Beethoven uh, uh, opera? I mean, both, all of them great composers, but why is it? I think it's, it's, it's the language. It's the sound of the language, it's the grammatic, 
You know, I have an Indian wife. She's always saying Germany, German sounds so. <laughs> so, and you can say it like that, or you can say it's very structured. So no, no, <laughs> that's that's what I prefer. <laughs> so, um, so, but so no wonder Bach Bach is German. You know, it's a fugue. You know, you have a fugue, you have one voice, and then mathematically, you can really count on after a couple of bars, there's coming the second voice, and then there's coming the first voice again, the second voice. It's organized. It's absolutely organized, and the art is to make music out of this structure. <laughs> because when you keep it just as a truck structure, we learn this at a music conservatory. I can write a fugue, but my fugue, unfortunately, sounds not like a Bach fugue. <laughs> so not it, this yet. is uh, <laughs> not there. Yeah. So this is this is the. So and I think even everything is so close in Germ in in Europe. I mean, it's a couple of kilometers to France, to to Belgium, to the Czech Republic, or like like Annette said, I was confronted with a lot of Russian quartets when I was young. Bordin quartet came over. Um, and they played wonderfully. So, but it's still really unique sound of every uh, string quartet. So I think it has to do with the with the language. But sorry, but also with the political situation, because I remember that um, Daniel Barenboim he said when he found the Staatsoper Berlin Orchestra, he found an orchestra with a sound 50 years before or 80 years before. It was really an old sound, and he's so so happy with this orchestra, and he, he tries, I think, to, 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 um, to, to, keep. to keep this sound, uh, because it was so, so special. In, they were in, in the east part of Germany. Yeah, with, orchestras was, with, is, with orchestras, so it's it much... very impressive for me. Yeah. 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 yeah, I think that orchestra is more, more, much more difficult yeah. to keep the yeah. unique sound. You see, like Berlin Philharmonics, sure. you know, with yeah. Fort Wengler Karajan, they had an absolutely unique sound. And nowadays they have a very, they are amazing, but they have a very modern sound. And I think like 50% of the orchestra are international. It's an inter international orchestra, meanwhile. So, uh, but like the Vienna Orchestra, they still, especially the woodwinds, because they have an own academy, uh, and they they has, they keep their special. Uh, sound, you know, the, the oboe has no vibrato, I think the flute is very, they have a special type of French horn, so they really keep their, their old sound kind of military-like, I mean really strict, while all the other orchestras are getting more and more mixed, you know, internationally mixed, so it's nowadays it's hard for me to to, 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 um, to really divide if it's, is it Boston, uh, Boston Symphony or Berlin Philharmonic, mm -hmm. you know, when you hear modern recordings. Really difficult, but when you hear old recordings, it's much easier. I think, so it's easier with, with smaller groups, like in the quartet, when mm -hmm. they are all coming kind of from the same, uh, same uh, country. Then it's I hear them so well, and I'm very curious. You know, I, the, thank you for answering this at this length because it's fascinating. You know, to have a perspective on this uh, quartet sounds. But going back to your comment about the language, this is fascinating because it relates directly to this work that we'll hear tonight. Um, because Janacek, as as you know much more than we, um, was fascinated with melodies of Czech speech, and mm -hmm. he called them speech tunelets. Mm -hmm. He transcribed literally thousands of these snippets of speech that he heard on the street and in shops and so on and he felt fervently that this was uh, an, an element that one could use and should use in music and he was inspired by them. Some writers say this is extremely valid and you can hear it. Other people say well maybe it was something particular to him but, and that relates it to what we're talking about. One other thing that just popped in my mind is that Somebody was telling me one time that for Russian singers, you know, people always say, what's the secret of the great Russian basses? Because they have that deep, mm -hmm. incredible low sound. And someone who knows about Russian language said, well, it might be because they, um, it, the way that people pronounce Russian involves different muscles in the lower larynx <laughs> and throat. And they use these in singing in the cathedrals, the, you know, the liturgy, who knows? But these things are all fascinating. Might be the vodka as well, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, this is a good segue then to talk about the concert yes. sonata it's number one. And it's just these the last two quartets of his life are just and, and stunningly dramatic, full of passion, rage, power. And I would like to hear from you how you approach these, uh, the, the intimate letters and this one we'll hear tonight, the Kreutzer Sonata. 
How did you first. come to the um, mental Yeah, I think, well, I, I love this subject. This is one of my favorite subjects to talk about pro what we call program music or not. Um, <laughs> and by the way, about composers' life and their work as yeah. well. This oh, is yeah. kind of the one of the same, same metal. Um, I am a big fan of looking at the work it's sometimes even without knowing who the composer is and without knowing what time it was, just the work. I mm -hmm. think the work is the most important. It's not important if Mozart was ill at this time when he wrote a certain piece or if his wife got a second child or whatever. This is, it might be interesting for us because we, are, we want to know about this, this, this person because we always... Uh, trying to keep why is he so fantastic and maybe I'm not or whatever. But <laughs> in, it's it's so we we have a certain interest in in biographies. But I'm a strong believer that it has nothing to do with the work at the end. I think the work is kind of um, a thing which is m much more than the person who wrote it. You know, the the work is much bigger than the human body who wrote it. I it's he he's a he was a medium. He was just writing it down. You know, it's a, it's a God-given thing, and it's written down, and he gave it to us, and it was, God chose just a random body to, to write it down. I mean, Stravinsky said his sacre, he was, it was flowing in three days through him. He was, it was, he was dictated to do it. Mm -hmm. So this is, I mean, this is the one thing. And then now we come to program music. I think it's very interesting, and of course we have to talk about Tolstoy. And it's so, but you can listen to this work, and it stays a fantastic piece without knowing anything from the story. It's the same with Strauss at uh, Till Eunspiegel. You, you, you can listen to this piece. It's a fantastic rondo. You don't have to know the story. When I was a child, I was listening to Tosca, and I was so touched by the music, I didn't have a clue what, what was going on. But I loved the music. And later, when I got to know the story, I, I, I was bored. I mean, it's, <laughs> the, story, the story is OK, but the music is so much better than the story. So it's, 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 uh, you can always. When it's about music, you can keep the music at it as it is. Of course, the story is touching. I mean, it's a masterwork, this novel itself. And it's fantastic how he made it. And, and, but the, the structure, as you talked about the structure, the structure, the music structure is so perfect, you can listen to it and enjoy it so much without knowing the story. And, and the next thing is that um, it's not important how we understand the story. Because um, if I try to understand the story, perhaps I associate my own bi biography or something, and it's so terrible if everybody of the quartet... <laughs> it's so terrible. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you have to, to stay objective. Yeah. It's the most important well, that's, thing. Well, that's why I wanted to ask you how you approach the work, because rather but than assuming that yeah. it was one way or another. But, yeah, um, we are sitting yeah. not there and saying, you know, oh, this is the piece where he got into the train. <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah, is yeah. this a train? No, I don't think it's a train. It can't be the train. There is where he's so angry. We don't that's talk terrible. about that's that at terrible. all. No. We just look at the music. Yeah. We see there's written fortissimo, and there's a crescendo, and there is. He's writing so <coughs> Absolutely amazing, pre precisely. Even you know when you hear the, you will hear the the, the, the first kind of theme. Bah, da, 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 da. It's coming three times, and it's coming every in a slightly different tempo. It's so precisely written, so you don't have to know the story. Maybe the train was a little bit faster there or something. <laughs> no, for, for, forget that. Uh, really, it's it's about the music. And uh, you, there are these a lot of people who study this and talk about it in terms of architecture. Yeah. And as you say, even if you don't, if you don't know architecture or whatever, you can hear them. Hear the uh, one person I was reading, Stedron, I think it was uh, Milo Stedron, talked about montage, modality, mm -hmm. and architecture in Janáček's work. And they're just so brilliant the way that they are put together. You don't have to be a musician or a composer to to perceive it, but it uh, must be fascinating to study it and to be so intimate with it. And there's so many things throughout this. Um, there's uh, some, Eugene Drucker, I think, from the Emerson Quartet, is one of many commentators who said there is a, can a canonic melody relationship mm -hmm. to uh, the Beethoven Sonata. Mm -hmm. Some people maybe don't see it as much. That's one thing that's of interest. Um, there's fascinating Sul Ponticello writing, and perhaps you'd like to yeah. speak about that. 
Mm. Yeah, there are some some special effects, yeah. and, and, and absolutely. Yeah. And but I totally agree. It's a, not a very sh long piece, but it's from the first note till the last note. It's so full of tension, and it's the the timing and the construction. Like, like you said, the construction is amazing. It's a uh, it's everything is uh, the architecture is just perfect. It's not very long, but the tension and the timing, and when he, even the last, uh, well, I shouldn't tell it so much because you should experience it, <laughs> but uh, it's the last note. It's short with a little fermata on, so it's absolutely great that it's not a long note, to, so he's not uh, releasing you at and the never end. Never sentimental. Yeah, it's never, never sentimental. <laughs> he's n not a whiny thing about this like the novel is. It's very objective, just looking at it as it is, and he is not rounding up at the end. At the end of the piece, when we do it right, you are shocked. You sit there, and the piece is stopping kind of in the middle. We are not giving you the time to relax again and to feel good again. You, you won't. You, you, you will be shocked. And, um, and this piece is like that. It's a, it's a perfect timing. I think music has a lot to do with timing. I mean, it's happening in time, so it's about timing, energy in time. And uh, he's an absolutely great master with it. And the timbre, too. Um, I hear so many fascinating uses of timbre against timbre and coming out of it and using timbre as a structural uh, conception, you know. Mm -hmm. And that there's a, a lot of fascinating moments where you hear these sort of outbursts, and you'll hear them very clearly. And some are like declamations, getting back to the question of speech and language. And he, he says one thing with great, uh, great outcry, and then there's a moment of pathos. Mm -hmm. So they're just fascinating. Um, I, I don't know how we're doing on time, but we, we could talk a bit more about this and about the toll story. But I know <laughs> you guys will have some questions. We have, we have a little more time. Um, <laughs> One thing that then we could talk about a little bit is this, uh, oh, a question about, uh, continuing just for a moment, um, about the viola. Is, does this quartet have a, a, a big role for the viola, like the second quartet, the intimate letters? Uh, I wouldn't say so. Oh, no, it's, it's, not, no, it's, it's kind of equal, equal. I wouldn't okay. say. Because uh, I know in that one he equates yeah. the viola to his, um, the woman he was obsessed with for so long, yeah, yeah, Camilla yeah. Stos, Stos. No, not, not exceptional. No. Okay. Or not like this Metana Quartet where the, where the instrument yeah. of the composer is. Um, that was one, one uh -huh. question I had. And mm -hmm. about in general, um, I was curious, your thinking on how you performed Dvorak and Janacek back to back. That is quite a challenge in a way, you know? Totally different, st but so connected. They were friends, right, I think? They knew each other Yes, but well. for, for us, really, also, contemporary music, it, it's all is music, and we go, we go with the same uh, feeling and with the same um, ser seriosity, seriosity mm -hmm. to everything. It's, for us, it's always, really always the same, from Miss Lievecek to contemporary to premieres. It's only reading the score and each piece yeah. is lives in its and own. Perhaps universe. a top secret <laughs> from our <laughs> our group. Um, we had times where we just discussed a lot about pictures in our brain, and everybody said, "Oh, I see this, and I feel <laughs> this," and uh, and it was so terrible because, "Oh no, no that's not my idea," and so we had to, <laughs> it. It was really uh, hours for hours. And one day we discussed and said, "No, please." Let us not speak about pictures in your brain, because also the pe everybody in the in the audience has his own pe pictures, and uh, we discuss about the score and what what is written. We hope that we have the ur text, the um, really what he wh what the composers wrote in this his time, and that's enough. And we we try to um, to realize. Yeah, has to, absolutely, <laughs> and it has uh, I think to do with our education as well. We <coughs> We are one of the quartets. I saw uh, the colleagues Artemis are coming. They are another quartet coming from the school he worked with the uh, great first violinist of the La Salle Quartet with Walter Levine. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, he's very, very well known here, of course. Yeah. He's a, um, our teacher. And <laughs> he was our teacher for many, many years. And uh, he was a, a quartet trainer, outstanding quartet trainer. I mean, all uh, famous quartets, our generation are yeah, educated by him, trained by him. And uh, he was a big, big fan of just doing what's written in the score. You know, 
once I, I remember I was asking him, shouldn't be this another color or something, another more colorful, another color, darker color? He was looking at me and saying, am I a painter or what? <laughs> <laughs> you know, he he wasn't he wasn't even talking in terms of colors, light, dark, or something. It was just about tones, dynamics, tempo, articulation, mm -hmm. and re. But in this particular, in you know, he really looked at the at the handwriting to find out if it's a point or a little, or could it be a legato or maybe more kind of another thing, you know, he was absolutely accurate in this thing. And this was very, very important. And he came always to the lessons with his Mr. Beat, w w which was the uh, metronome. A metronome. Oh, yeah. Always he first metronome. He was <laughs> tapping to find <laughs> out if he keep the tempo oh and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So this is, uh, this yeah. is kind of our, our school. So we, uh, we decided not to talk too much about uh, our emotions. And by the way, I mean... But we have. We have. Yeah, we have. And <laughs> we Walter have. Levine had it also. I mean, yeah, I so often saw him after a great performance with tears in his eyes. He, he, of course, he, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But working and talking about music, it's more helpful to really see. You know, we are, we are, we are not really um, artists in the sense that we create something new. We, we are just like, like actors are. Repu we are bringing reproducing. Yeah, we yeah. are bringing something mm -hmm. to you. So it's not us tonight, we are just delivering. So um, our emotions or my emotions I have when I hear the music I'm playing tonight um, is my personal stuff. I don't want to be in between the, the work, the composer's work, or let's <coughs> even keep the composer out, as I said before, about the work. I don't want to be in the way of the work and you tonight. I'm just delivering, and I hope I do it exactly how the composer's written. I'm not playing it less loud because I think it's nicer this way or more loud. I'm, I, I try really to do what the composer was written, and it's up to you how you like it. I don't smooth things up, and this is uh, why Annette said we don't uh, discuss even about the quality of certain pieces anymore, also. and this brings us to yeah. modern music as well. Mm. We are delivering. We don't decide if, if it's worth bringing an odd stage or not. I mean, who am I to decide what, what kind of, what quality it is? You should decide. I'm just delivering it. Without me, you never, when I decide this is a, not a good piece, then it, it won't come to you. And you might like it a lot. So who am I to not give you this piece? So I think it's very important, maybe this is a bridge to the modern music, it's a, we have, it's like, you know, like, like mountain climbers, when they are ask, why are you climbing on mountains? Their answer is because they are there. So uh, the, mu the modern music is there and it must be performed. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's not living. That's what Wolfgang Riem said always. My music is not there if it's not played. And so we have to play it and you might like it or not, so yeah. But you're doing a remarkable job, really, as I was saying. Of, you, you should look at their recordings of these masters that, that, that are uh, and we continue monuments always. today. Yeah, yeah. and always <laughs> growing. And I wish we had time to talk about how the string quartet repertoire is growing, the techniques yeah. and all the things which you are pushing it um, to do and so on. And also, we didn't cover the Tolstoy the sonata. We, I mean, le novella, we didn't get there quite. But um, one last question, and that is, do you ever think of the Dvorak quartet? at in American terms in any way. Uh, this is, having said what you've said, it seems like you, you don't, you wouldn't see it as an American influence or American sounds or anything. Yeah, yeah, there are a lot. There, there are, are some, yeah. yeah. And especially today we came by car from Salisbury <laughs> and I saw some things and I, Associated uh, during the rehearsal really? now, yes. Oh, yes. It's, what were yeah, they? because um, our travels and we travel a lot are always oh, that's also right, the Virginia countryside. Yeah. Because <laughs> we drove from, you know, Maryland, Salisbury, yeah, Maryland, yeah. you said. So we saw already so much nice. from the landscape and the uh -huh. people and um, also the black people, and uh, everything is so inspiring for, for um, our job. <laughs> yes. <laughs> also, and the language, also. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's, of course, there is a lot yeah. of... I mean, he traveled over the country, yeah. and he, uh, he talked to the people, and he listened to the songs, mm -hmm. and of course, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, it's a lot of American influence in. And every, but then, of course, we always 
as the title is American, and he was in America, and it was, um, but then there's a lot of Czech parts in it as well, because, sorry to say, he didn't, he want, he, uh, <laughs> put it this way, he was happy to go back. And um, <laughs> he was, yeah, he suffered in New York. I mean, he, he was, it was not, so, um, so he was uh, happy to go back, and, and he, was, uh, he was very religious, and uh, he went to the church mm -hmm. in New York, and he found a lot of other people, this, the same spirit, and so, mm -hmm. and you hear, so you hear in this music, uh, sometimes we forget that this music is about uh, chorals, uh, church uh, songs as well, and you can hear them as well. And then on the ship, he wrote the cello concerto, and really looking forward, forward to his mm -hmm. to his home. But it's really great to play this piece here. Yeah, it's wonderful. Oh, it's oh, <laughs> incredible. Well, we're looking forward too. <laughs> yeah. Well, Justin, uh, quickly, does someone have a couple questions for them before they get ready? Oh. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> struck by your comments about the, the contrast between Slavic and Germanic quartets. Yeah. It strikes me as an amateur quartet player and listener to many recordings that there is an oral tradition as well as a written tradition. Yeah. And that many of the, the works of Dvorak and others came out of a period of great national spirit. Yeah. And when I listen to the old recordings, and when uh, the, what the first concert I saw at the library was this Methna Trio here in 71, uh, there's a freedom with tempo yes. that's very interesting, and I wonder if you know, how a modern quartet can acquire that spirit. Yes, yeah, absolutely right. I, we have a very, very uh, nice and uh, great colleague, uh, Gérard Cossé, uh, he's a viola player, and he told me that he is telling his students, and now I'm telling the same story to my students, about a tempo in German, German tradition and in uh, Romanic uh, traditions or French, Italian tradition. And he said, he's always uh, telling a story, he said, you know, in Germany, when, when the lights are red, nobody is going. It can be two o'clock in the morning, no cars, the house behind you is burning, a German is not crossing the street, it's red. <laughs> so when Beethoven is writing, a crescendo, that means crescendo. And when there's written a supito allegro without a, uh, without a natural arando before, it means supito. It means that. And the music is working like that. Only that. Of course, you can do it, but then you are, you are leaving out the traumatic. In France, it's different. When you are at the, at the uh, uh, how is it called, the middle, uh, yeah, uh, et, et, etoile, it's called, etoile. Place it's etoile. Place etoile. Everybody is crossing the streets. <laughs> it's red, but who cares? <laughs> it's, it's traffic anyway, and the, the cars go like that. So nobody, so uh, Gérard Cosset, it says, it's more an advice, the light, <laughs> you know? Red is an advice, so better you look when you, well, you can walk, but you better look. <laughs> The same with the music. When Ravel or Debussy is writing a CD, it's more like, well, depends, you know, how far you reach there. So maybe it sh would be good to do a CD, but maybe you are s slow already, so why shouldn't you go? You will feel it, my friend, you know? <laughs> and the music is working like that. That's, that's, uh, that's, uh, and there we are coming to mentality and, and, and language. Yeah, it's different. And it's only a couple of kilometers away. It's <laughs> another mentality. How total is oh, how uh, total is your inclination to totally av to avoid the historical context in which a piece or parts of a piece uh, appear? Uh, take as an example, you are sight reading for the first time the Smetna Quartet. You get to the last movement, and you have this intrusive harmonic, uh, prolonged harmonic. Would you stop and say, what's he driving at? What's he trying to do? Or would you just go on and do the best you can with a very uh, enigmatic uh, kind of a juncture uh, in the movement? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's a fantastic question. We always discuss about uh, intonation. Well, we, we try to, to analyze, you know, function-wise. What is the function of a certain chord? And then, of course, we, we don't play uh, temperate. Sorry, this By is getting very... By the way, we play from every, um, all our repertoire from score. You will see this evening. So we, we always know... Every, every piece we play from score. 
Um, so we know the voices, but we analyze. And uh, we are big fans of playing uh, not temperature. Well, of course, there are some music. Sorry, it's getting very specific. But we, mm -hmm. sometimes you have to play. In, like in 12-tone 12, 12 music, you have to play temperate. But normally we don't. So we always try to, to analyze what kind of chord it is because we are still f listening and kind of probably everybody is link, listening functional. So we are, we are listening the, f the function of certain chords. And when it's getting, like you said, miraculously, like, like Wagner, you know, the Tristan, this Tristan chord, so what is it, you know? Then uh, we try kind of to figure out what it is and coming close as possible to the function we listen. And then we adjust our intonation to that, yeah. Is this, is this what you meant, kind of? Well, I mean, uh, he had in mind his hearing loss, or so we are told yeah. by the announcer who inter introduces the piece. Maybe that's all fictitious, yeah. but the fact that he was reminding the listener yeah. of a painful uh, juncture, yeah. milestone, yeah. in his life, in his uh, yeah. you know, professional career, yeah. could be viewed as something important or yes. not. Of course, it, it, it's it's. I, mean, I think this is a private thing. As I said, I mean that the, the music stands for its own. But of course, you you feel that there's something really dramatic happened, and of course, I mean the title of the piece uh, from my life is is saying everything. So you are really uh, somehow you you have to care, and you know. So I mean, when you read the title, so you can't say, uh, okay, I don't care. So a little mm -hmm. bit, you are there. But still, the music is not, or let's say the music is not getting better when you know exactly uh, uh, what happened. The music is great already, and would be even if you don't know that it's biographically. Thank you. Um, you mentioned uh, um, Walter Levin as your teacher coach. Um, um, I had a small experience with him myself, and I wanted to bring him up because he did just die in August. For uh, maybe a name familiar to some of the audience, but he was the he was most known as the first violinist of the La Salle Quartet that made many great recordings on Deutsche Grammophon of Haydn, Beethoven, Mozart, but also Schoenberg, Berg, Weber. Yeah. Um, uh, I went to a private school, uh, uh, which would be about the equivalent of a gymnasium. Um, I was, say, 15 in a string ensemble. The headmaster of our school happened to be friends with Walter Levin, so he got him to come to campus and coach us in some Mozart. It was very, very brief. This guy was tough. Um, uh, <laughs> and and, and uh, kind of like Toscanini was with the orchestra. I mean, this is how he was with the string quartet, and, and because he cared so much about the music. And he maybe didn't worry if he said something a little gruff or rough to the musicians because it was in service to the music. Um, <laughs> and if, if he said, if you play something and he said, well, that wasn't bad, that was like the highest praise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so I, I just wondered if you had maybe a few more stories about, about what, what you got from him. You want to have some anecdotes about him? <laughs> uh, one or two. Well, I, I, I remember, it's always, uh, I remember one scene Okay, the older he got, he got more mild. So, <laughs> it, 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 but when I started studying with him, for example, he said to a colleague of mine, I mean, we were all listening to the, to the, to the lessons. So, so the, the hall was always full when he was teaching. And so I remember first he was saying to, to a colleague of mine, to another cellist, wow, you play wonderful. And after that, he he was always criticizing him. So first he gave him a suite, and from then on, he was keeping it. And one time, um, uh, what's uh, the name of his wife? Um, uh, Evie. Uh, Evie. Evie. Evie was, Evie. Evie, his wife was very often with, in, uh, with him while teaching. And I remember once he said, he turned around and said to, to Evie, you know, it's been a while that someone cried here on the stage. <laughs> you know, so he was, he was really, Sometimes really, sad, really, really hard. But he had also a very nice a little boy side. I was a little bit closer to him sometimes, and I have some letters uh, with him where he uh, wrote me very nice also about his time during the World War. I have at home. I'm very proud. <laughs> and um, sometimes he, he uh, one time he said that um, he had uh, bad dreams, uh, that he cannot play violin. 
So um, I think he, w he was also very angry. So, um, and this was where the both sides, this uh, very hard teacher and on the other side, the little boy. Um, so <laughs> yeah, and he was <laughs> it's very impressive. Boy like he was fascinated by tennis. I remember when we, yeah. had, when we had lessons to Wimbledon or all Australian Open, <laughs> He wasn't able to teach. So he said, well, guys, <laughs> I, I care a lot about Schumann Quartet, but you know, now Federer is playing, I have to go. <laughs> He's, and, then, and, then he came, and then he came back and said, I wish I could play violin like Federer is playing tennis. He, he, he thought Federer was a genius when, when Federer came up first. So uh, because of this elegant style, you know, not really just power, power play, but really elegant playing. So um, yeah, he had this side uh, as well. And uh, he always knew he was kind of, uh, this at, at home, it was like a quartet headquarter. He knew exactly, when he was getting older, he knew exactly, or spe especially his wife, if he uh, was knowing exactly on the map worldwide where all his quartets were, you know, <laughs> touring. So I, I once, I, we had a concert in, in south of Germany, Baden Weiler, a famous place for, uh, for quartets where uh, La Salle played a, l a lot of times and Walter was there and we were doing, I think, lecture recitals about Nona Quartet with him. And uh, afterwards we had a dinner together and I, uh, I was sitting next to Evi and Evi was telling me, Artemis is in Budapest tonight and I think uh, this quartet is, is in Sydney and this one is in London tonight. They know exactly kind of where the fleet <laughs> is. But, but also, also on, th on this place, um, I heard <laughs> when this both this couple um, were in a room where there were old pa wallpapers um, about with old programs from Amadeus Quartet, and if you said to Walter, "Oh, look, this bad programs," <laughs> without second Vienna school <laughs> or something, <laughs> so. And Some maybe last thing, he nice yes, it's <laughs> nice to remember him, actually. Yeah, he, he was a, a great, great And he was nervous behind the stage. I remember that when we, when we played at the Schleswig-Holstein Festival, when we were very young at this, in the, in the first years, during the first years, he came, we had a master class with him, and he came behind stage and said, did you tune? Did you tune? <laughs> we said, yes, Walter, we are not doing it for the first time. We tuned, really. And he was so nervous uh, for us, for kind you. of. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing these <laughs> fun memories, <laughs> interesting ones. Thank you for being with us tonight, and you will love this concert, really. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.